Hello and welcome everyone. If you just sit tight, we're gonna give everyone tuning in home just another moment to join us and then we'll go ahead and get started. Hi, thanks everyone for joining us so far. We're just giving one more moment for people to go ahead and get logged in and we'll get started. Just bear with us. And okay. So welcome everyone and thank you for joining us to the fifth of our six events under the Elevate Your Career Next Level online series. My name is Kate Krause and I'm the Director of Alumni Relations for the School of Engineering. I'm joined as always today by my two colleagues, Alyssa Kelly, the Director of Alumni Relations for the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences, as well as Josh Poo, the Director of Alumni Engagement for the UConn Foundation. Um, we will be your point of contact today should you need anything, and we will certainly do our best to serve you if you have any technical issues or need assistance throughout. Um, as many of you know, normally our Elevate Career Month features events across the country uh, in person, so while we certainly miss being able to gather with you face-to-face, -face, we are so glad that you're joining us online today. Uh, we're thrilled to share with you a lineup of truly outstanding UConn alumni who work within the scope of business, technology, and law. Today, they're going to do their best to give us an inside view of their professional worlds, talking about how now, more than ever in the midst of a pandemic, their fields are fully integrated across disciplines and the exciting career opportunities that this is going to present to us. Before we jump into our program, I'm just gonna take care of a few housekeeping items. Um, the chat feature today is open, so we encourage you to go ahead and drop your LinkedIn information in there. If you'd like to network with your hello, fellow Huskies, um, engage with one another, and just take the opportunity to build your network, we encourage you to do so. Next, Josh, Alyssa, and I will be monitoring the chat feature, and we'll be chiming in from time to time, so if you have any concerns for us, please feel free to message us during the chat. That said, we will be taking questions from the audience for our panel. We ask that you utilize the Q&A function located at the bottom of your Zoom toolbar to submit your questions to the panel, and we will do our very best to answer as many of your questions today as we can. Um, and then lastly, we encourage you to check out all of the UConn alumni Facebook groups. We have 27 regional groups around the country, and while in-person events are on hold for right now, it's always great to know what's happening among your local Husky networks. So jumping back in today, I am pleased to announce to you our moderator. He is a familiar friend to the UConn Career Series, John Brady. John is an executive coach, a keynote speaker, and a frequent media source on matters related to corporate and career performance. His current and recent clients span the US as well as the United Kingdom and include executive senior leaders of Goldman Sachs, General Electric, Hewlett Packard Enterprise, Apple, Shell, Aeromark, Southwest Airlines, AstraZeneca, IBM, UPS, as well as the federal US government. Mr. Brady is a veteran of more than 25 years in education, banking, and science and technology sectors. He has experience of growing the talent and top line revenue of small businesses, nonprofits, as well as Fortune 500 companies. John is joining us today from his home in Houston, Texas. So welcome back, John, and thank you so much for joining us today. I'm gonna to hand it over to you to introduce our panel and take us away. Wonderful, thank you so much for that. And uh, Kate, before I dive into this, I believe there's a, once you get the things squared away on the tech end, I think there's a poll you wanted to start with and initiate in the background while we're doing our, um, while we're doing our introductions here. We have truly an amazing panel of, uh, uh, of experts here for you and UConn alums. I get the, uh, the, the work of getting to prep and not only read everybody's bios, but cyber stalk them a little bit. And uh, they all both uh, impress me and maybe even intimidate me a little bit, but they're really just, it's, it's really just a bang up group. So uh, be thinking about your questions. This is a tremendous opportunity to have a crowd like this available and accessible uh, to you. First, uh, in no particular order, 
reporter, Fernie. Fernie Gracie is the chief digital officer uh, for Ajiro in Medford, Massachusetts, having previously held executive positions at Simpress and Pitney Bowes. He's a 1985 graduate of the School of Engineering with a bachelor's in computer science engineering and a 2015 inductee into UConn's Academy of Distinguished Engineers. Bernie also has a master's in computer science from RPI, Rensselaer Polytech, and a master's in e-commerce from the University of Maryland. In 2019, Bernie was awarded CIO of the Year for Greater Boston and was recognized as one of the top global executives leading innovative business transformation. More recently, in 2020, he was a founding member of the Conference Board's Chief Digital Officers Council and was recently named in the list of the top 20 CIOs who are shaping the future of technology. And as if all that weren't enough, Bernie has eight patents to his name. There are more pending. And just as a heads up, Bernie, your corporate bio needs an update because that one still says seven. So they missed something somewhere. But if I translate all that into English, this is a guy who uh, understands and works in tech development, architecture, infrastructure, and innovation across really rapidly evolving ecosystems that are powered by digital, mobile, cloud, location-based services, and IoT. So real interdisciplinary, cross-functional kind of guy. Um, hopefully we got the responses to the first poll. And as I turn to Louise's introduction, uh, you'll understand when you see the second poll from Kate, why she's putting that one up there. Uh, Louise Kennedy is a business law attorney with extensive experience advising tech companies on strategic and commercial matters, including software commercialization, cloud computing, strategic alliances, and all aspects of online business and contracting. She's advised startups, mid-sized private and public companies, as well as Fortune 100 enterprises in a variety of matters. That is just an amazing level of scalability for any area of practice. Also, uh, also including M&A, mergers and acquisitions, employment law issues, open source software strategies. I have no doubt a lot of intellectual IP law and other things. Louise particularly enjoys working with small and medium-sized entrepreneurial businesses. And hopefully we got the um, poll information that uh, Kate can share with Louise. Moving down the list, VJ, Dr. VJ Raghavan is uh, Director of Engineering at MathWorks, a name that most of you are probably familiar with. If not, they've been around a good long time, an amazing place. He manages various product areas in the fields of simulation, verification, and validation. He received his PhD from UConn in sequential fault diagnosis algorithms. I had to underline that because I was really afraid I would say it wrong, uh, for which he received various best paper awards, including Andrew P. Sage Best Paper of the Year Award back in 1999. His technical interests span model-based design, graphical programming languages, compiler technologies, code generators, simulators, interpreters, and automatic test vector in generation, excuse me. He has over 15 publications, 1515, with eight journal papers and holds over, this is not a typo, holds over 45 U.S. and international patents. Bernie, you got to work harder and keep up, man. He is the 2019 inductee of the University of Connecticut's Academy of Distinguished Engineers for his contributions to the engineering profession through research and practice. And having looked him up, I, before the panel opened, I noticed that his sort of avatar headshot online was Darth Vader, which just elevated his cool factor in my mind as a real Star Wars nerd here. So um, BJ, I'd like to have you. And last but certainly not, not least, Dan Surfity. Dan is Aptima's co-founder -found, and CEO. He's led Aptima to become the premier human performance engineering business in the world. His work optimizes the integration of humans with intelligent technologies in defense, healthcare, aerospace, and education. His keynote addresses around the world are encouraging his audiences to imagine a future in which human and artificial intelligences work together in the service of humankind. He's the host of the MindWorks podcast, where he engages with thought leaders in exploring how machine learning, data science, and technology are transforming the ways humans think learn and work in the age of AI. And by the way, I poked around his podcast a little bit. Some of the topics are really, really just sexy stuff I wouldn't have really thought of. Socially intelligent uh, AI, things, topics like meet your new AI coworker, that kind of thing. Um, sensor related worker safety stuff, really amazing. It's worth a listen. 
if you have the time. Daniel's interdisciplinary background includes degrees in mathematics, psychology, aerospace engineering, and international business from University of Paris, Israeli Institute of Technology, and obviously UConn. His doctoral work has pioneered the study of distributed command teams. He's the recipient of the UConn Distinguished Service Award and has been inducted also into its engineering hall of fame. All of these people uh, with, of course, only good intent as I read their stuff makes me feel terribly inadequate and maybe even stupid, but that is only uh, meant as a compliment. Y'all are wonderful. Thank you so much again for being with us. Uh, I'm gonna just uh, dive right in here and uh, Bernie, for a moment, I'm just gonna start with you. The chief digital officer is a role that um, has been uh, evolving. Uh, it's, it's a more recent C-suite level title. I'm not sure everyone really understands what it is, or maybe they just often mistake it for uh, just being another uh, kind of synonym for maybe like a CIO role or a CTO role, but it's it's often a little bit more specific than that. So is there, in, is there a way that you can kind of uh, simplify that for folks who may not be familiar? Yeah, the, the, I guess a good way to net it out, the chief information officer title is typically an inward facing role, not, I would say traditionally viewed, right? You're, you're basically working in the back office. You're, you're basically making the company hum. A chief digital officer role is where you're shifting left all the way to your client or your client's customers. Uh, Jero, our work is a, is a white labeled uh, B2B roadside assistance company. We serve 115 million drivers. We have the largest insurance companies and the largest automotive companies in the world with their clients. When, you, when you're digitizing a, a company who used to basically answer telephone calls for people who are stuck on the side of the road, where now you're responding to their connected vehicle or to their, their, their mobile apps, you're doing the ultimate shift left. So a digital mindset is literally thinking about the ecosystem, the how to get closer to our clients, closer to our customers, and adding value to all stakeholders in a multi-sided platform. So it's, a, to re, it's, it's more of an outward facing mindset. Understood, understood. And um, Louise, I'm gonna turn to you and looking at, um, it, it wasn't specific in your, uh, in your quick bio sketch, which I got tongue tied on just about all of them, yours included. But um, when I was looking at your background, first of all, it was amazing to me how many areas of law in the early part of your career you got to practice. So I realized how much that probably informs the work that you do now, but it looked like you did a stint at IBM. And I think what I was also most curious about is whether just something about that time in IBM awoke something in you since now you're so focused on uh, that niche area of law and supporting tech companies. And if you could just talk about yeah. that. Absolutely. So um, the way I actually ended up at IBM is kind of an interesting story. So I was a litigator, as you noted, in my in my initial uh, few years as an attorney. It's what I always assumed I was going to do. Um, and so in the late 1990s, um, here in Massachusetts, there actually was not a rule that said that electronic mail was discoverable in litigation. And so we had that issue come up in a case that I was involved in as a very junior associate. Unfortunately, no one else in the firm knew really what email was, how it worked. Um, they had their assistants print out their email and put it on their desk and they would write responses on them. So as a second, third year associate, I was able to actually present, write and argue to the judge that the large pharmaceutical company who was on the other side of the V should have to produce email. Um, so uh, we won. Uh, we got some really great national publicity from that. It was the first case in Massachusetts and a very early one in the country. And it kind of put me on the radar screen of sort of the, of both the technology industry and they and put sort of them on my radar screen as well. And it was a good stage of my career to sort of make that transition um, from a, um, a more litigation focused practice to a more transactional um, practice. And then at IBM, my experiences there are really what encouraged me to start firm that I run now, which is West Hill Technology Council. Um, and we're a boutique business and technology law firm. Um, we currently have seven attorneys um, that sort of cover the needs of small to mid medium sized businesses who are in the tech space. And the reason I formed the firm is in my last year at IBM, we were looking to do acquisitions in a particular area of technology. We did deep diligence and anybody's ever been through deep dil diligence knows or <laughs> God forbid IBM diligence knows, you know, this army of people descends upon the company and reads every piece of paper you've ever signed. Um, 
of the six companies during that year. And, and your emails, one. now we know that, right? So. <laughs> As a, well, the, thank goodness it wasn't litigation, so that was good, but um, only one of them could be acquired. The other five bombed out of diligence for one reason or another, and predominantly it was issues related to intellectual property. And, and what I said to myself was, if these entrepreneurs had had me early in their, in their, in their sort of journey with their business, they would have had their right. big payday. Like, they, they missed it. They hired the a, a corporate real estate lawyer to do their licensing deals. They hired the guy who does DUIs down the street to handle all their employment related stuff. So that um, what inspired me to start my firm. Um, and it was a fabulous experience and an incredible training ground um, getting sort of rotated among the divisions at IBM. Wow, that's a, both the discovery as well as the due diligence stories are great. We'll probably end up circling back to that stuff at some point. Um, BJ, or, or should I say Lord Vader, um, great, to, <laughs> great to have you. Um, one of the things that uh, I, not only that I noticed, but specifically commented on uh, in doing the intros uh, that uh, you as, as well as Bernie have a number of uh, patents to your name, whether there are other names um, attached or not is, a, is a, a whole other matter. But I do know that certainly uh, for people who work in highly technical uh, spaces and career tracks, especially if they're with a company for a, a significant tenure, as as you have been, um, that that drives a lot of the nature of your relationship with your employer in a certain way. And I mean, at forty five, like that's a that's a lot. Um, can you talk a little bit, not so much about the patents, but about the extent to which um, those kinds of contributions really uh, have, have impacted your your career trajectory and path at MathWorks, or maybe that of others that you know who also have patents to their name there? Um, so um, the patents, I mean, when you look at patents, things like that, that's, those are the, uh, those, those are the results of the, the journey that I took, right? So I joined MathWorks 25 years ago after graduating from PhD from UConn Engineering. Right. So I was very fortunate uh, to join the company when it was somewhat small. It was about 300 people. So uh, I was an engineer working on a new product, but uh, because it was such a small company, it was possible to make a difference, right? Because uh, it's a small boat, you could move it around. If it's a big ship, it's much harder. So, and as, uh, and one of the amazing things about MathWorks is the, the culture at MathWorks really values engineering so much so that the engineering leadership is uh, pretty much almost always grown from within and they encourage engineers to move into <clears throat> leadership and management. So that actually allowed me to grow, not just technically, but also career-wise, right? So I started as an engineer, individual contributor, and then uh, over time I became a manager, manager of managers. And now uh, as a director, I manage a whole bunch of different areas. And uh, so this actually allowed me to uh, touch various different technical areas. And that's something that I feel really fortunate about. And uh, yeah, for patents, you know, it's just a result of it, but really more than that, I, I really value the, the kind of skills that I learned, which uh, go well beyond technical stuff, right? It's, it's about how do you hire well? How do you grow an organization? How do you build the next generation of leaders? And, and also more importantly, as the organization grows, there, is, um, there are human dynamics that, I, that you have to deal with. How do you navigate a, a large organization and try to get something done? So these are, these are th things that it was very fortunate that I kind of grew with the company. So uh, I learned a lot of those things as the company was growing. So this is something that I feel really fortunate about. Wonderful. Dan, um, I wanted to ask you, I know you, I think probably more of you uh, do as well, but I think you speak like at least three different languages. I only have the one, I'm sorry. But um, I wanted to ask you uh, specifically, while I know there's a tremendous interdisciplinary nature to your work, everybody's talking in some way about where the technical world and the human world, that, that point of intersection that, that, that nexus point, um, but 
I, one of the things that seems to come up a lot right now is, uh, at least in, in my observation, and you can correct or amend or comment on as, uh, um, as, as you wish, it, it's, it's sort of like when for a while we were talking primarily about big data and pretty much all data started getting called big data, regardless of whether it was or not. And I feel like there's a little bit of that going on with AI. If there's an algorithm or you know some lines of code that are just running any level of analysis, it's kind of getting slapped with the AI language. When I was a business student, um, I was doing uh, my MBA internship for a technical company, uh, which eventually was acquired by, by Hewlett Packard. And one of the engineers there uh, love to remind me that there's a difference between architecture and architecture, <laughs> but um, I guess I wanted to ask you a little bit about just the the way in the business world, anyway, people are talking about AI right now, and the way that's just informing whether it's the way you look at anything from your your podcast to, of course, your primary uh, work at your company. Yes, thank you for. Uh, it's a very important question to ask. Uh, I don't know if I have the answer though. Uh, the, uh, I think that what's going on is, um, here's a couple of numbers that can uh, give us a sense of the scale and the impact of the introduction of AI and automation and robotics. Uh, McKinsey produced a report uh, about a year ago, projecting that in 10 years from now, in 2030, 30% of the works jobs are gonna be displaced by AI, that's, that's more than a billion jobs. Uh, this is important. This is not, uh, this is as big a revolution as a previous revolution, whether it's the industrial revolution or, or others that we've seen over the past centuries. I am arguing here that the, 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 it's a, it's, the displacement in, is not an elimination. It's a transformation. All our jobs, all our jobs around this table and beyond are gonna be transformed by AI at different degrees. If you are a radiologist today, uh, your job has nothing to do with the job you were performing five years ago. Because now you have system that, uh, AI system that can read images, millions of images, draw inferences, and if it's well designed, interact with you, the expert as a radiologist, and now you have a team of AI and uh, human experts trying to make a determination regarding a diagnostic or even more a treatment for a patient. And if you analyze all of our jobs, whether you're a teacher or, or even a lawyer, Luis, <laughs> or, uh, or an engineer, our jobs are transformed in front of us. Some of, some of it is more urgent in some areas. And so my point here is that in order to design those system better and to provide a not necessarily a replacement, but a transformation, we need a true interdisciplinary uh, approach to it. And, and by that, I mean, we need to understand the human side of the equation at the same level of granularity and depth that we understand the system level at the algorithm level or at the, uh, at the uh, data level, as you mentioned. And I think it is precisely at the, at, at, if we design that interaction well, we have a chance really to, to bring a lot of positive changes in society. So I don't know if I answer your question, but that's perhaps the beginning of- No, you did. Okay. Well, it's, it's an opinion question, right? So um, in, in that sense, you absolutely did. Thank you. Um, because this is in fact a panel and people are here to hear from all of you and not me, uh, I invite you as I start throwing out some larger questions for each of you to either um, contribute in your own way or even uh, connect with, with one another. Um, in every single one of your histories, I mean, my superlatives and uh, quirky humor aside, I, I mean, you, you all really do have pretty amazing backgrounds and different things in your academic and professional histories have given you opportunities to, uh, to flex muscles and Dan's response, right? That interdisciplinary word kept coming up, but cross-functional kind of thinking kept coming up. Louise, just your story about like, you know, being at the forefront at the right time of, um, you know, case, what would be case law around discovery process and what was and was not 
discoverable, right? There's, um, it's, I don't think it's easy re reminding us that this is in fact a career panel and people looking at this and trying to think about how they advance themselves, make themselves more marketable. Uh, it's a long, it's a long road to always, or it's not always either practical or possible for someone to go and get another degree. Um, if whoever wants to uh, kick off here, just give a little thought to ways either you or uh, people in your orbit, people who report to you, people that you mentor uh, are able to start kind of um, cutting their teeth in areas that are adjacencies to their core discipline or other ways that they start getting more of that interdisciplinary exposure. And I'm not sure who wants to start, but. So, uh, I, I do. <laughs> so, okay. All right, VJ, and then we'll go to Bernie. <clears throat> Sorry, Bernie. <laughs> um, so first, I, I, I do want to comment a little bit, uh, you know, given that it's a panel discussion, uh, when uh, Dan was talking about jobs being displaced, it, uh, it kind of reminded me of the kind of fears that people had almost 20 years ago when I started at MathWorks. We were selling mathematical tools to automotive and aerospace customers and telling them, listen, you use our tools and you will be able, instead of doing a lot of things by hand, you can automate your work using our tools. And one of the fears was, uh, sometimes the engineers themselves asked us, does it mean my job is going to be eliminated uh, by using your automated tools? And the answer that we gave them was absolutely not. It is, It will never replace you. What it will do is it will make you a lot more productive so that when you're spending 90% of the work on some boring stuff, which could be automated, then you do that really fast and then you can spend 90% of your work on other stuff, innovating and doing high value things. And I have to say, this is something that we said, we believed in it and it was proven to be true. If you look at the automotive industry, the systems engineers, the, the, the the engineering cohort in these companies has actually grown much, much faster than the rest of the industry. Yeah. So the, the automation did not actually eliminate jobs, but actually it made them a lot more productive. As a result, they'll be able to, they were, the company was able to hire a lot more people. So I'm more of an optimist in that sense, uh, where I actually think that automation, AI, or uh, technology advances will eventually help mankind create more employment, not less. Uh, the, the transition can be painful for some people, no question about it, but overall it's a good thing. Um, so anyway, that's it. I just wanted to say that piece. Bernie, uh, go ahead. Thank you, Bernie. <laughs> Bernie, yeah. Yeah, I, I think the, John, you talked about adjacencies. Um, I, you know, degree in engineer, software engineering, software engineering management, all kind of going deep inside that. Um, I can look, I can trace the trajectory of my career to a moment that was an accident um, where the chief technology officer of the company was supposed to visit a client. He got appendicitis. I was a last minute replacement, had to fly out to uh, Kansas City. And this was a company that had not done business with us for years because of my visit in a very non-traditional way. I walked out with a million dollar deal, which was not scheduled. The salespersons were thrilled um, because this was just a meet and greet, but it turned into a solution. And that turned into the, the maximum, I would say for anyone in their career, be close to customers, understand the value chain, understand how your company makes money and then find out who pays the bill. From that interaction, the, the business unit president said, hey, do you think you could repeat that? And we created this new market-facing, client-facing solutions organization. We knocked down massive deals. It was, it was crazy. And that by having that market understanding and customer understanding, I pursued a role in product management and marketing, right? Basically market-facing, client-facing. I had never thought as a Yukon engineer, I'd be doing anything other than writing software. But I realized that when engineers are problem solvers. And so in this case, I was solving my clients' problems. And so you can... Never be afraid to take risks, but the only source of more authority, we're all smart people, we all, we all have great opinions. The only source of moral authority is the guy that pays the bill or the girl that pays the bill. I don't wanna make say it in that sense. He, uh, we all have to serve somebody and the client is the one that counts. I think it's a great place to start. Anybody else? 
or thoughts you want to add it on that? Because I, 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 I just think that's important given how how that was one of the many red threads through all of you that that um, experience that are outside of what you would have seen as your core area. Yeah, yeah I can I can give it a shot. I mean, I I. Uh... I love interdisciplinary work in general. I think uh, somebody say that, but the nuggets are really in the seams. The nuggets are, as, as, as Bernie said, when you can apply you, your engineering problem solving skills into a customer uh, you know, relationship problem and you understand how to solve her or his problem. Um, and so I would encourage folks to look, not to be afraid of the, the tyranny of the, the single discipline which comes from academia because folks who succeed at least in my industry or, or adjacent industry are folks who can move laterally who can understand what the marketing department says and we can understand what's the 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 uh, finance department say and can, can we understand with another engineering department said and it's not just about understanding which is my, the, the the second point i'd like to do it's not just about going and getting an MBA, although you can do that certainly, but it's also um, those skills that people call soft skills, which is a term I really don't like, you know, soft and hard for me is like cheese, you know, you can, you can do both, that's fine. I mean, you can, yeah, no, one is not better than the other. The ability to solve a differential equation is not more important than your ability to work uh, on a team or, or to work on a, uh, to, to, to show empathy and to show the ability to see the world through the eyes of the other, which is really what probably Bernie did in that first life-changing meeting. Yeah. He was a customer for a few seconds and could understand his problem there. That is not something you learn in engineering schools necessarily, uh, or at least not in a formal way, even though when you work on a team, you do. So I would encourage very much our audience to not only travel laterally in terms of uh, traditional uh, disciplines, but also give uh, the right emphasis to those so-called so-called soft skills. I call them just work skills, leadership and teamwork and, uh, and empathy, because these are the one that are going to be your differentiator or your competitive differentiator at the end of the day. Everybody can solve the differential equations, or most people can. Everybody from UConn can, let's put it. <laughs> Every graduate from UConn can, but, but very few people are able to exercise the, <laughs> those, uh, those qualities. Louise, I wasn't sure, were you trying to jump in or did I? No, we can move on. I, I, oh, I think okay. that Dan covered a lot of what I wanted to say. Oh, well, there we go. Um, well, I'm, I'm going to put you on the spot in a different way. Okay. Um, part of your uh, part of your story kind of also, I think, answered some of that question. I mean, a lot of it is, uh, you know, being in the moment, right? Like recognizing kind of that calling the audible, the heads up ball is a chance to do something different. But um, in the poll that Kate put out there, while I realized it, it wasn't the majority of our attendees who are uh, considering or planning on going to law school, there, there are some, but also uh, like so many functions, I often think about whether it's outside counsel or in-house counsel. Um, there are so many ways that I think uh, a lot of folks don't uh, don't always see the areas where a certain subject matter expertise can be really helpful. Uh, and in the case of law, not just when you're in trouble <laughs> or when yeah. you're trying to make sure you're within compliance on something, right? Like there's a lot that... that there's something to be said for legal logic or things that uh, I think as you had said, and I'm, I'm paraphrasing, but gee, I wish these people had talked to me earlier because, right? Like the, there's, an, there's a way that you could have had an impact on the business. Looking at that from just the legal lens and yours, uh, what generic just guidance would you, would you put out there? Because ultimately that serves uh, one's individual career well as well. I mean, calling on those resources that you have access to. 100%. So having been both an in-house lawyer and having been a, in private practice, I mean, I, and I don't really approach those two things substantially differently. I think of myself as a member of the team um, of the clients that we help as outside lawyers. Um, the number one piece of advice that I give to folks who are thinking about working with lawyers for the first time or maybe reevaluating their relationships with the lawyers that they have are, does the lawyer explain things in a way that 
are business oriented. What are the business implications of you signing an agreement with this provision in it? If they can't explain it to you in a way that makes intuitive business sense to you, then there's a disconnect there. That's the role. It's a great the, example. It's the role of the lawyer to be able to say, you know what, here are the three remaining issues in this contract. And um, I think that in a matter, in, in terms of risk, I prioritize them this way and, and then let you make your business decision because that's really what the lawyer's role is, is to help you understand the implications of the things that you sign um, or the positions that you take. Um, the other piece I think that I would tell people is that um, we've already heard the word patent a lot already during this conversation. And to me, the patent is the beginning, not the end. You can have all the patents in the world. You can have great software. You can have all these intellectual property assets. If you don't take care of them in agreements, um, you have nothing. Um, you give yeah. that stuff away. If, you say, if, if a large company sends you an agreement, um, Nine times out of 10, they're, they're basically taking ownership of everything that you have. Um, if you don't have a lawyer who understands that, knows where to push and how to push so that you can retain ownership of all that intellectual property, you're gonna be in a bad spot. Um, so having a business lawyer who really understands IP, not just how to get you a patent, because to me, you know, that's become really, I'm not, my husband's a patent attorney. He's also a UConn alum. I don't want to disparage what he does, but it becomes somewhat commoditized. It's really how you take a patent and develop a business based on it in a thoughtful way that creates a lot of value uh, for the business. So as someone in the organization is sort of working toward that space of either starting their own business or being in, in a management or leadership role, I think understanding and having the right expectations with regard to the relationship with, with the attorneys is really important. So just uh, to build off a little bit, yep, what you said, I have an attorney on my staff, um, mm -hmm. which is, you know, think about chief digital officer. Why do I have an attorney? Well, we procure massive amounts of software, right? Mm -hmm. And we're also generating our own IP. I cannot tell you how much she has gotten, to, you know, protected us, whether it be in looking at every single agreement, what rights we could be giving up by even through a simple click through agreement, how we set up and protect our intellectual property. We're also doing a lot in AI. And one of the things that, you know, she has been so helpful for us when you're dealing with AI, the AI company wants to train on your data sets. You basically could be translating what you know into another company who could then go to your competitor with everything you've learned. Mm -hmm. So it is your lawyer partnering with that business acumen and your engineering acumen that can help enable you, but also protect you. So yeah. you think about a career, law is exciting, right? Because it's a natural extension of engineering as well. Or if you're a lawyer, you know, about how do you apply that, you know, for people who are developing, you know, engineering based products. So it is, yeah. this is a time of interdisciplinary. I'd be lost without my attorneys. Yeah. And it's funny what you said about the, about looking at the inbound agreements, because a lot of business people or new business people think, well, I really only have to worry when I'm sharing stuff. If I'm sending stuff out, that's where I need to worry. No, the much larger issue often is when you're bringing third party assets into your business and making sure A, that you're not getting sort of um, contaminated by them, where you then can't use the things they or have limitations in your freedom of action, um, or that you, you're just, just restrained in what you're able to do. So yeah. I, I agree completely. And I think one of the exciting things about being a lawyer in this space is I get to talk about different technology like all day long from multiple yeah. different companies. And that's super fun. Before I shift in, you've been wanting to just a quick uh, to support what we said, you know. I may be jealous. There are many more jokes about lawyers than there are about engineers, though. But, <laughs> but uh, uh, the um, one of the things that I learned uh, as CEO, uh, fortunately or not, you have to deal with a lot of lawyers in different areas for good reason, is that as engineers, we are trained to optimize performance. That's 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 how everything we do is about. Lawyers teach us, or a law degree, if you add it to your engineering degree, will teach you how to minimize risk. And these are like two different ways to look at the world. Optimize performance, maximize performance, minimize risk. And it's, you cannot do one without the other and be successful in business. Um, just as a reminder to our attendees, I, I, I like to start broad and then narrow down. So uh, we're, I know some questions have started to come in and in some cases uh, 
there have even been a few answers that have come from one or two panelists, but we're going to start leaning on that a little bit more. Remember, they are here for you, uh, not, not, not for me. So uh, if you haven't uh, started throwing your questions out there, well, I can't guarantee we'll get to all of them. Uh, the more that are in there, the easier it is for us to synthesize and, and move forward and make sure that you get value for your time being here. So it's uh, a good time to start thinking about that and entering that in the, in the Q&A uh, panel. Before we um, do that, but also in keeping with kind of shifting again, this is a career-based panel. So while we're talking about business broadly and a little bit about uh, career stuff, what are the kinds of things that we really should be, um, that, that our attendees ought to be thinking about uh, in the like very near to intermediate future, right? It's, uh, the, given the areas that you all work in, uh, it, it is in fact your responsibility to think so many steps out ahead. But uh, the, what is it that people are really either talking about now and that are probably gonna impact the kinds of, whether it's job opportunities, uh, areas that in an interview setting, somebody should be talking about or having some familiarity with, um, whether it's listening to Dan's podcast or any other uh, sources of information, what's that kind of stuff people should be ready to start speaking to in these broad areas of engineering, of tech, of the intersection of law and business? Um. <clears throat> Louise, why don't you go first, and then we'll yeah, mine is quick. Move around. I, would say, I would say privacy. Um, when I look around and I see what my clients are struggling with the most, um, it's compliance with California privacy, GDPR, Canadian privacy, uh, all the different countries that have their own approaches, especially with the upheaval in Europe right now over what the standards actually are. Um, it's like trying to hit a moving target but we expect to see a lot of additional enforcement in this area. So I think, and every business has this issue. So to the extent that you have some knowledge and some general understanding of what's happening in the world of data and privacy, I think that will go a long way. BJ, were you trying to flag us down to for a response? I'm not sure if I saw a hand go up there or not. If you were, if I'm mistaken, my bad. No, maybe I, would not. Do, I would do an ad okay. secure, yep. security. Cybersecurity. Um, yeah. So much of you know when you think about digitalization, and everything we do, you you have to be on, um, and you have to think about resilience. Uh, even even with the uh, the storm that just hit, we had so many companies had their data centers out because they didn't think through their fuel situation. They may have had generators on the roof, but they didn't think about fuel additive. But between bad state actors, other actors who are, are who are basically doing ransomware. You have to think about resilience. The Christmas Day bombing affected us. We have so many of our employees were based in Tennessee, and that took out big chunks of AT and T. And they're you know they will work from home because of COVID. You have to constantly be thinking of threat scenarios, and then you know making sure that your operation is resilient. It's a whole different way to think, and also how to get funding for. But in this world between weather and cyber and physical threats and terrorism, domestic, international, resiliency and security is absolutely critical. And yeah, just continuity of operations broadly. Got it. So- um, Is there anything else? Yep. <clears throat> yeah, so from my side, I um, <clears throat> being at MathWorks, I, I get to see a lot of these uh, different uh, technology areas that are uh, getting ahead. And one of the things that is becoming very clear is, <clears throat> Uh, consumer-centric technologies seem to be uh, exploding, at least in this decade, and I, I see that happening for the next decade. So, uh, when it, so the example being, 20 years ago, uh, aerospace industry was a much bigger market driver compared to automotive industry for any type of uh, engineering design software, right? But now it's automotive, consumer electronics, medical systems, and so on. And uh, the, the, the key difference being the aerospace and defense seems to be these large scale, um, you know, almost like a state uh, level type of industry. Whereas the rest of them are really directing towards their, their smaller, discrete and uh, consumer centric. So 
the, the, uh, that said, within that, there are so many different fields that are just uh, growing like hell uh, in the last year or two. But, the, uh, but I want to take this opportunity to answer a question that I see. Uh, it's because it's kind of relevant. <clears throat> when you're in a job, I mean, ideally, you want to find a job in a field that is growing uh, so that you grow with, with the field, you grow with the company. But what if you're stuck in a company that is not in any of these fields? Okay, what if you're stuck in some type of, I don't know, the old old style, uh, old school uh, business and you wanna make a transition? So that seems to be the question, how to stand out and have opportunities. I think it's from Natalia Santos. And uh, so this is actually really important. Uh, and I've seen uh, people do this very successfully and I've seen people fail at it. And what I've noticed is this is called a two box move. So you're in a company that is not in a hot field and you want to go move your field and the company, right? So those are, you're trying to move a, uh, along two axes simultaneously, right? You want to change your company and change your field. You, it's really, really hard to do that in one step. So which means you do, you, you do one step at a time. Either if within your company, if you can change your function, and move to that different job function, which is growing, well, do that first and then move the company later. Or if that's not possible, move to another company, keep the same job function, uh, but then within that new company, change your function once you get a bit of credibility. So these are two different approaches you can take. Hope that answers your question. I thought there was somebody else who was about to chime in that I, if I'm mistaken, I'll just, <clears throat> I'll just keep moving. Dan, was that you or are you? No, I, I can, I can chime in on that uh, with one word, uh, or, or we can wait to other questions. What do you want me to do? No, go ahead. Go ahead. I, I think you ask us for the one thing, and I agree. Actually, my three uh, co-panelists uh, mentioned that in one way or another. Uh, I would say data. Um, both cybersecurity and privacy and, and uh, also the guidance that VJ uh, gave has to do with the, the preponderance of data as the main currency. 10 years ago, the currency was algorithms, models, uh, you know, those things. I think algorithms and models are becoming a commodity. And what will differentiate between uh, two engineers or two companies doing the same thing is basically the ability to have data, to process data, to own data, to do something with the data. And therefore, I would say even repositioning yourself as a way to move within a company or you know, make the company more relevant uh, as a data scientist, in a sense, all engineers somehow are data scientists. They just don't know that. Uh, but it's just where you put basically the spotlight on your, on your own uh, skill set. We've had a couple of questions come in in different forms here um, about where you all expect to see the most just change in movement in the near to nearish future. And I suppose the last year, and Bernie, you were alluding to this in a, in a way, right? Um, there's, there's some things that were happening already that got accelerated because of planet COVID here. There are just other world events, whether it was what happened in Tennessee, as you were mentioning, um, you know, the, as I live in Texas, we saw, you know, what happened with the grid here and the kind of ripple effects that we're still feeling down here at, you know, more personal levels and uh, business levels. But um, in your respective areas, if uh, whether related to some of the big event, bigger events that have been more newsworthy of the last year, or just things that are na just naturally accelerating in terms of, uh, opportunity, interest, change. Uh, where do you see most of that? And again, I just keep reminding, keep the answer kind of from a career perspective when someone's trying to think about how I navigate this. I think COVID has changed consumer behavior. We've, we've what people were anticipating was gonna occur in 10 years occurred in five weeks. Uh, every business is now a digital business. And I think, you know, when you think about it from a career perspective, if you're on the business side, 
you need to understand technology. When we were talking about adjacencies, I was talking about if you're in technology, get closer to the customer. It means get closer to the business. So there is really where maybe you were like in a stovepipe. I'm in IT. I'm in engineering. I'm in legal. Now everything is everything is digital, uh, which is, means it's horizontal and it's interdisciplinary, as Daniel was talking about. Um, and so you really need to embrace getting out of your comfort zones and thinking about how will you be, make your business more efficient and even closer to your, your clients, your stakeholders. I think that's what's the lessons of COVID. Everything has changed. Everything has changed. Others on this? Uh, well, <laughs> to be uh, a contrarian, yes, COVID has changed a lot. And, uh, but at the same time, uh, for instance, due to COVID, there is a lot more online and video-based collaboration. In our own company, we just moved from all in-person meetings to all video meetings, right? Which is great. It's, it's working out really well. But I also believe that there is absolutely no substitute for human interaction, like the face-to-face -face interaction, just being with other people. I mean, that's what human beings, I mean, that's what we were conditioned to do, right? So as this pandemic is going to end, which means the life uh, before is gonna come back in one form or the other. Some of the, some of the habits that we developed during the pandemic will probably stick around. For instance, I know for a fact that in our own company, we'll probably stick, uh, stay with the video meetings because video meetings are <laughs> strangely effective for a very interesting reason. I noticed that when somebody is in a physical conference room attending a meeting, they're essentially unreachable. So if I have a question for somebody who's in a meeting, uh, good luck, I can't get it, right? I have to wait until they get out of the meeting, check their email or what have you, and then reply to me back. But now when people can multitask on a video meeting, right? So they get a text, uh, they can reply to a text and unblock a colleague. And I found that this was actually very interesting side effect of the video meetings where suddenly people have become a lot more productive. So, so some of those changes will stick around, but I think the whole face-to-face -face thing will, will still be very important. And the reason why that is important, especially for those in early career, what I've noticed was during the pandemic, someone who's been with MathWorks for like two decades, I know exactly who to call if I have a problem. But if, I, if I'm a new employee, I wouldn't know because my only interaction with the company is through a screen, right? So that's, uh, it would, I mean, imagine how hard it would be to develop connections and friendships and you know, things like that when you, when you first join a company with a all digital world. It's, it's tough. So I think that's where uh, it's really important to, to keep in mind that the old world will come back and let's be ready for that. And that is in, uh, especially important for uh, when you're starting off, creating those human connections across your company is really important. And not just among your own like you know, little group, or if you're an engineer, make sure you make some friends in sales and marketing. Okay? And if you're in sales and marketing, make some friends in engineering. Uh, and definitely make friends in uh, HR and recruiting because you know they're gonna help you quite a bit. They're really, really important. And the way you do that is by branching out. Uh, the way you make friends outside of your own immediate uh, circle is by, uh, it's a lot of the times you just follow your hobbies. If you're a runner, find a running group. And in fact, I found a whole bunch of uh, friends across our uh, different uh, departments because I'm a runner. And there are musicians who do the same kind of thing. So this is something that I would really, really recommend people to do. Pandemic is going to end when it does. Double down on developing human relationships because those are the ones that are going to help you advance uh, through your next stages in life. All wise, all wise counsel. Um, whether you're thinking about your own hiring um, or just, again, kind of in, in general, uh, what are the sorts of, th there's a lot of, and I, I work in this space, people who are making career pivots or changes or whatever, it's hard enough to be able to, I think, make that case because we tend to think in a very linear fashion. Um, and there was a question earlier that somebody answered or addressed about kind of making the lateral move, but um, what, 
with the ability for so many people to just even submit applications, uh, the whether it's your HR, talent acquisition, you know, recruiter partners, whoever, um, in some cases they may get hundreds. If it's a really big, well-known company, uh, it could be in the thousands of uh, submissions, and they're trying to sort through all of that. And while that extreme is is pretty rare, uh, what in what ways do you recommend that? Uh, people stand out as candidates on paper or digital paper, right? So that uh, you or the people on your team are going to likely take notice and and, uh, and give them an opportunity to have a more meaningful uh, dialogue in an in interview setting or uh, or any other type of like direct intera interaction with someone who's influencing the decision. I think Louise, you were first. Yeah, sure. So I'm obviously coming from a very small firm. Um, perspective, but we, we absolutely hire and we're growing. So we're always looking at resumes and we're talking to folks. Um, and we've discovered that there's certain characteristics that make people really successful here that we are always looking for um, during our interviews. And it, we, you can actually sometimes even see it on the resume or in the cover letter. We're kind of old school. We kind of like to see cover letters and we kind of like to see thank you notes and that sort of thing because we think it shows that you actually care about uh, about the role that you're applying for. But what we want to see evidence of is concrete evidence of a true love of learning. Are you someone who loves to learn and is constantly wanting to know what the newest and latest and greatest and staying on top of their game and has a wide range of interests that they stay up to date on? That's, that's one thing that we're always looking for. The second is someone who's just willing to pitch in and help. And that's one of the questions that we ask during interviews is, can you give me an example of a time when someone asked you to help with something that was not within your job responsibility and you did? Um, because for us, that's another factor that really contributes to your, to your success here because we're a very collaborative oriented, um, collaboration oriented organization. Um, and passion, I think that's the third one. Um, I need to know that you're, You've looked at our website, you've, you've read our mission and our vision that we put like right out front and that you have some excitement about some portion of it. And, it, and we can usually get a pretty good sense right up front whether that's sincere. And that will tell us a lot about your um, interest in, in working with us. Yeah, I, I am very big. Thank you, Louise. You and I think alike, apparently. This way, it's my turn to say that you say most of what I wanted to say. <laughs> but uh, the uh, I am very big on passion. I mean, for me, this is a key differentiator. So I want to say a couple of things. Uh, two, one is uh, there is a war for talent. If COVID uh, taught us anything, is that location and geography is less important than it used to be. So... Uh, in my company, uh, we have actually brick and mortar buildings in four different states. We're headquartered here in, uh, in, in Massachusetts. But we are paying taxes in 24 states, as my CFO complained to me on a daily basis. Uh, and so because basically you go where the talent is, if somebody is in Indiana and fits the bill, just hire her right now. <laughs> because if you don't, somebody else will. Uh, and so that's the first thing. The second part is really on the person. If you are in the audience and you say, you know, I want to make a move, do your homework. There is nothing as attractive as a candidate who comes and knows not just what they learn on the first layer of your website. That's actually quite suspicious when people repeat the word that they saw on the web, on, on, on the, on the web page, but rather... Um, have critical thinking regarding the company, critical thinking in the sense that they try to think about what are the challenges, what are the strengths. And as they speak about their own strengths, they implicitly show the mapping or the matching between what they can bring and what, what you need. That for me, sometime you know within, we had a candidate uh, yesterday and we, she gave a talk within three minutes of her talk, literally, I knew that we were going to hire her. That was obvious. I mean, she didn't, uh, we wasted time for the next four hours, you know, with the interviews, but it was clear. <laughs> and so my point is that do your homework. You know, it's a two-way street, especially when you're in high demand. And I'm sure that folks, most of the folks listening today are in high demand. Just you have a pick of the kind of company that you can work for, do your homework and go after them before even they go after you. 
and you looked like you were leaning forward. I wasn't sure if you were just making yourself comfortable or if you were about to. No, actually, I was. Something. I didn't want to put my glasses on. I was looking at something in the chat, but um, but uh, I I will add um something at least in our area. Uh, one thing that has clearly changed over the last three years is that we've changed the clock speed of the company. Um, you have to innovate faster. You you, know, you have competition. And to be able to work at that clock speed, we have to decentralize more. So we're asking people even earlier in their career, looking for people who are willing to take risks, willing to make mistakes, willing to um, uh, take a leadership role, right? Um, and we have a culture and environment where we're very humble and we are rapid learners. We always do blameless retrospectives. If something goes wrong, like what did we learn? How do we pivot with, with the, the premium on speed? So really what we're looking for are those people who want to lead uh, at all points in their career. They may be a junior engineer, engineer, senior engineer, principal architect, but people who are looking to stretch themselves. We're looking for those five Xers and 10 Xers um, and, and for people who, who you know, are looking to grow in their career. And that is, we know we're a great place for them to be able to do that. Yeah. In what other ways than those already mentioned, can somebody in your minds, demonstrate that before they're in a position, because the hard part often is getting in front of somebody uh, interview wise, right? Like then you can, your passion can come across uh, in that way or the your questioning strategy, you'll get a sense as you know, Dan was mentioning, like I knew in the first few minutes, right? You get that just the you know, technology's changed, human nature hasn't. Uh, so I mean, all of that's true, but still I think it can be very, very frustrating for people, they know what their target company is. They have a great background. They know what they are going after, um, but it just seems so intimidating. Um, and certainly as a practitioner, I have my own answers, but I mean, given uh, from your perspective as um, as, as really the, the, the core leaders in the business, what would your answer be to that? So before they've gotten to that right. uh, so, level of visibility. Yeah, uh, yeah, this is something that I've seen, but I mean, uh, for us, when we advertise, we get literally hundreds and thousands of resumes, right? And going through them is, is quite a bit of a chore. So um, I'll, I'll tell you about my own experience. When there are all these resumes, uh, it's really hard to read every little word in that resume, right? So uh, not just me, but you know, managers like me uh, who have this uh, task, get into the habit of scanning. Right, so you quickly scan the resume to see if it if it's interesting, right? And uh, I'll tell you the kind of things that that usually catch my eye. So um, in your resume, depending on like you know, what where you are in your career, right? If you're a if you're a student, if you have a fantastic GPA or some type of academic honor, just put it there. Something that just that is out of ordinary, whatever that is, just put it in there. So for example, if I say, oh no, 4.0 GPA, great. Now, if you don't have a 4.0 GPA, don't bother. Instead, mention something else. Uh, in fact, more impressive than uh, GPAs and coursework and all that is uh, evidence of prior work experience that I can verify. What it, so an example of that is a, a link to a GitHub site or uh, the, some other website where I could click and go check out their previous work. Maybe you know, upload your... Uh, it, it's almost like a digital portfolio of what you have done. If, if it was a coding project, upload the code so that before even I bring you in or interview, I can take a look at what you've done, right? Say, oh, look, this, this person is fantastic. Maybe we should bring them in. So give me uh, as much information as possible, not just the resume, but like, you know, put extra information on a website or GitHub or LinkedIn or what have you, and then put those links in and then make them stand out. So those are the ones that I've, I've noticed. And then, oh, fine, by the way, I completely agree with uh, Daniel and Luis, where I've seen candidates who um, make the cut through this resume thingy, but then they don't do any research at all about the company. They come in without even reading our website. By the way, <laughs> at least reading like the first level website, I give them some credit. There are people who don't even do that, and that's bad always research the company, find out more. And then the last thing is in order to stand out, especially with larger companies, uh, the best way is don't send the resume into the, to the main resume submission system. Find somebody who works there and get them to refer you, get them to forward that resume to other managers or something. 
that is one of the best ways of standing up. Um, in fact, it's human nature, right? If you if you get a resume from a colleague, you you will look at it as opposed to uh, some random resume out of thousands of resumes in a database. So. Especially if they went to UConn, right? Yes, <laughs> exactly. In fact, that's a perfect segue, right? I mean, are there particular things, whether it's about the nature of interacting with as UConn alums with other UConn alums, your own uh, UConn experience, this is after all uh, a UConn community. And uh, as I always call it, it's a real community of helpers. Uh, what are the things that are specific to the institution? Again, whether it's just thinking about your own um, history, it could be from your time as a student uh, or resources and ways that you kind of leverage connections now that, uh, that folks listening ought to be thinking about and maybe doubling down on. Oh, definitely exploit your LinkedIn connections. I mean, if you find somebody on LinkedIn uh, who went to UConn, def- feel free to reach out. I mean, uh, LinkedIn is, is a fantastic way to create new connections. And that's, that's, that's the number one thing. And then, you know, if they reject your connection, not a big deal. Who cares, right? But if they accept it, pursue that. I mean, that's one of the best ways of uh, finding a new job these days. Uh, nine out of 10 uh, people who find jobs these days is through uh, referrals and connections as opposed to uh, a, a, a cold resume submission. So. Others? I, I think that I feel an obligation to pay it forward. I mean, UConn propelled me in my career and not only the School of Engineering, but the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences. I, I, when I think of my favorite professors I can, I can speak to the great professors in, in the computer science, but also for me, it was in, it was in English. Uh, they taught me how to think, how to communicate. Um, so when I reached out by any UConn graduate and anyone listening here, connect with me on LinkedIn, I'll leverage your network. Uh, anyone from UConn, um, you know, all three of us, you know, uh, all four of us, you know, with Louise, I know in the School of Engineering, we, we give back, um, we'll, we'll give back to the community. And the community for those listening, you need to do the same thing for other UConn people, other graduates coming after you to keep the doors open. So I think we, that's what's, what's great about being part of the UConn nation. Well, look what you created, John. Now we're going to compete for the audience because we're all hiring. <laughs> <laughs> and, what, and whatever, indeed, I think that both be... You're uh, on to me. Sorry, dude. <laughs> <laughs> You're on to my, my, my play. VJ and Bernie said, I agree, uh, connect. I mean, you, you, you have our, uh, you can certainly reach us through uh, UConn and uh, or through LinkedIn. And by all means, don't, don't forget in a, in a note to say that you're a UConn graduate in business mm-hmm. or in, in, uh, in engineering or any other department, you certainly will get our attention. You're all highly visible in your own ways. If someone does reach out to you, and I hope they'd be understanding about the fact that it might take you a little bit um, with everything that's, that's coming at you, how should they, how should they um, prepare for that kind of uh, conversation if, the, if it's that there's, there's, just, there's something like just connecting on, on LinkedIn and having you as part of at least their digital network. But you know, if somebody reaches out to you, they wanna have a conversation. Um, it's important for them to be able to extract real value out of it so that you can mentor them and help them, but also um, uh, so that uh, I guess you're, you get the information that you need. I think it's very easy to say, okay, I'm going to reach out to this person. And there's this balance between you being able to mentor and help them, but them just kind of throwing this big, hairy issue at you, like, you know, how do I do this? Right. So, um, how do I make that next move, right? Or uh, even if they just want to be noticeable and kind of be that seed for the next uh, opportunity in your organization or whatever, how should they prepare for those conversations? What should they be coming to you with so that it's a meaningful exchange, even if there's not something that's immediately available that uh, either a job or a connection that, that will land them one? Go ahead, Louise. Louisa, why don't we start with you? Yeah. With me? Yes. Okay. All right. Um, so I would say having a list of specific asks in addition to sort of general guidance and support is super important because it helps me to understand where it is you want to go. 
Um, it's interesting, we had a, a woman come in and do an informational interview with us um, just over a year ago. And she was very specific. She said, I was in the intellectual property clinic um, and I learned that I like to do X, Y, and Z. Um, where are, you know, can you give me some, some suggestions on sort of when you can make the transition from working in private practice to maybe working inside a company with that particular skill set? That's a really concrete question that I absolutely have information on. I can give her examples of the people that I know with that interest and that skill set and going and taking that path. So I found that that kind of thing sort of sets the tone for a really good conversation and then maybe lends itself to sort of broader, more general guidance and, and topics. Another violent agreement with Luis. <laughs> if you have 15 minutes, if you call me and we have 15 minutes on the phone, don't tell me that you, you know how to program in C++. That is not what I want to know. I want to know what you want. Be ready for the ask, what you are smart. <laughs> kind of, I learn how to work on a, on a, in the automotive industry. I'm very interested to develop autonomous system for, for car. That's good. That tells me about your aspiration. And then I know exactly where to vector you or to tell you, you know, call me in six months because right now I know. Whatever it is, it's not about what you are, it's what you want. That, that's really what I'm interested in. Any others? There's another question I want to kick to the group, but before I do. Okay. Um, well, there was one response already. Um, uh, I, I want to throw this one out there because I think it's a, it, it's a good one. Uh, someone who's in the first year of their doctoral program was, uh, was asking about the most desired qualities or skills that they ought to focus on developing in addition to their core area of study and research. Uh, and I suppose in the, uh, well, well, a, a JD is a, is, is a doctor. I think that applies to law students as well. So anything just outside of what we know to be standard curricular and, and research uh, based area in your, uh, uh, in your discipline. No, I can go first. Um, so we, we actually hire a lot of PhDs at MathWorks. And one of the things that we really look for is the ability to communicate. And by communication, we don't just mean being able to do formal presentations, but the ability to explain complex ideas clearly and simply in, uh, in a variety of settings. In fact, most of the, we, we are fine if somebody could just get on in front of a whiteboard and explain a concept. We, we are not looking for like, you know, these massive PowerPointing skills. Now, of course, those are, those are also useful, but the, the, the most important skill that, that you would need, uh, that, you would, uh, that would set you apart from other people is the ability to communicate. Uh, of course, that, that's something that is actually, uh, that, because it is, I don't, as uh, Dan says, I don't want to call it a soft skill, but it is a really, really, really important skill. And it's a, it's a skill that you could kind of measure and improve and uh, you know, uh, practice at. The other, I don't want to call it a skill, but um, it's more like a find a way, uh, because the life of a grad student is often very lonely because the research, it's, it, you do your research on your own and the only other person that you interact with is your advisor, right? So find a way to interact and work with other people. If it doesn't happen within your lab, seek out opportunities outside of work, okay? Go volunteer someplace or join a sports team because you really need to know how to work in a team and how to work with team dynamics, okay? These are, uh, these are really, really important. Um, those are two things that I would, I would advise. I mean, uh, because uh, as uh, Dan said, anybody can solve differential equations, but uh, those who can work with other people, who can communicate ideas, they can get ahead much, much faster than those who cannot. I can't solve differential equations. I'm just yeah. going up to that right now. So not everybody, almost everybody, <laughs> but you know. Um, <clears throat> Any anybody else that we missed on that response? There's another one I want to throw out to the group. That I think is a great question here. I think, yeah, and I, I would just double down a little bit on what Vijay said, and in particular, 
very strong writing skills. There's this idea that in our current culture that with texting and with sort of shortcut um, communication, that somehow that's acceptable in a business setting. In my experience, it, it lends itself to misunderstanding. Um, writing a clear email is a superpower. Um, and we find that we need to train people in that because they don't know how to communicate their ideas in writing in an efficient, clear, short, concise, consumable way. Um, so if you can work on that, on that skill, you'll be much, much more valuable to our organization, I would think to pretty much any organization. And then the second one is don't be a jerk. Um, and I know that that might sound- This is brilliant, but it's true. Yeah. I, I, I meet lots of lawyers who are jerks um lots of people obviously um and no one like we only exist we're only here because of our clients right and so we don't we're not smarter we're not better and i would say the same thing to people who are coming in as engineers don't assume that you're the smartest person in the room um because that is such a turnoff um on the on the business side of the business and it really holds back innovation um and it really holds back growth and profitability of a business Preach. I love it. I actually just, I think this was yesterday. I heard about a deal that kind of went south. I mean, I guess I'd call it what's up. It didn't, the discussions didn't advance because in a more informal exchange between the two parties, somebody was just asking about, you know, this conversational colloquial kind of stuff, like, where are you from? And in the most pompous way possible, the other party answered, by naming the very prestigious institution that they attended and not that loving your alma mater or being proud of your achievements is a bad thing, but it immediately left the way it was presented, right? Like he didn't even really answer the question. <laughs> um, it was just all about kind of having that label. It was a very pretentious kind of thing. And this guy just mm -hmm. said, you know, I don't, I don't need to do business with somebody like that. I wonder how many millions of dollars got lost because somebody was a jerk. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's, I love it. Speak truth. <laughs> that stuff is great. And in listening to all of you, that reminds me before the next question, while I'm thinking of communication, a lot of it's knowing your audience, right? When is it important to have a nuanced response? If you're talking to a technical person, you know, getting right down into something might be the most efficient, concise way to do something. Whereas in another audience, you know, a lot of those details can take you down rabbit holes where that, you know, the, the person reading or listening isn't quite sure where they're supposed to focus. Or if you're making an executive level presentation, knowing what information is relevant from a business perspective. You know, somebody, Bernie, it might've been you um, talking earlier about like, you know, who's, who's paying for all of this? Who's the customer? What's the larger ecosystem of stuff here? So, uh, and then the different modalities of communication, right? So whether it's something in writing um, or whether it's verbal or something more interpersonal, like the communication covers an awful lot of stuff, even just the signals that we send. You know, if you're sitting in a conversation all the time and it's much more noticeable in this digital virtual world that we're all doing right now, when someone, and you can see me doing it and everybody knows why it's going looking at chat windows and Q and A's and stuff, but people know when you're not, they don't feel like they're being paid attention to. And it's true in a meeting room as well. If you know we're all back in conference rooms again at some point, that sense that someone's really present. Uh, there's a lot without saying a, or typing a word that, uh, that 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 falls under that communication umbrella that I'm always reminding people is important in the interest of time. Even though there's so more that so much more that um, that we could talk about there. I already lost my question, my train of thought here as we were going down that, but um, I thought it was important. Where did it go? Uh, oh yeah. This was something that I remember in one of the uh, Elevate uh, conversations we talked about last year, but I think it's really important. At the level all of you are at, both as individuals, but also your companies, your organizations, or just advice you would give to somebody you care about, which at some level hopefully includes all of the Husky alums listening. There's this whole work-life integration thing. I've stopped saying work-life balance because I don't know the... The, the horses out of the barn to a certain degree, but um, there's a lot of pressure. You know, we were talking about innovating quickly earlier, right? The pace and the speed of organizations has shifted. Uh, there's information requests coming at us all the time. There's the sort of 24 seven stuff. 
what are the ways in which you model uh, taking care of yourself, your own humanity, your people, um, and uh, and expect them to operate, or in what other uh, ways, perhaps if your organization is just doing something that's a little bit more, uh, it doesn't even have to be innovative necessarily, but that they've demonstrated a real commitment to so that uh, people don't feel like they're basically uh, just capital equipment that's expected to go 24 seven. Bernie, you seem excited about this one. So you go first. (laughs) My, um, because I have bizarre sleep habits and I'm always thinking about work. um, My team may get a Slack message from me at four in the morning or on a Friday night or on a weekend, but I have to be conscious to say, I don't expect an answer to this till Monday. Please enjoy your weekend. I just wanted to get this out there while it was fresh in my mind that we, we as managers and leaders have to respect that people have families, that have lives, that have their own passions. And so while we may be at different levels in the organization have you know, fiduciary obligations to shareholders or owners, what have you, um, we also have an obligation to the health and welfare of our people. So I think we have to respect those boundaries. And I know even when I'm having my one-on-ones uh, with folks, I'll be saying, how's your family? You know, how's your kids? What, what, what are the challenges? What are you doing to take care of yourself? Here's what I do to take care of myself uh, and, and, and to give them the space to be vulnerable. And I, as a leader, I have to be vulnerable to them and say, well, this is what I do, right? To, to kind of do that balance. So I think more, you know, who knows when we're all going to get vaccines back to normal, quote unquote, in September. This is now going to be so important just to keep that humanity t- top of mind, all right, and respect those boundaries. Others on this before we throw in one more question and then we'll probably be getting to five minute warning pretty soon. Yep. Yes. I, I, uh, my job has changed drastically in the past year, or let's say it has uh, the leadership component of being the CEO has uh, been transformed. And I think for, for, for good, um, the, the, I, I find myself, and, and that's a prerequisite to communication skills uh, that uh, uh, others have mentioned here. Um, you have to be much more, you have to show empathy, but empathy is really the, the key word of this year. Uh, it, it, and empathy is not just at the effective level. If you practice empathy, you'll be a better communicator. You'll be, you'll be a better salesperson. Uh, it's basically perspective taking. You need to put yourself in the shoes of your employees, of your customers, of your partners. Uh, and as a result, I think that the, the this year has taught us to, you're talking about wor- work-life integration. There is so little separation right now between my office and my bedroom, basically. Uh, and the, and the, uh, uh, the ability to understand and to understand that every single individual, even if you if you run a 500 person or 2000 person company, every single individual has different needs. For Jennifer, the source of stress is because she has three kids on Zoom all day long under the age of 10 at home. And for, for Paul, the source of stress is because he's single and lonely and didn't have a social life for the past year. And so we need to understand that, that those differentiation call for a different kind of treatment and care and engagement and communication and leadership. Luis? You're on um, mute, Luis. So yeah, so looking at this from the perspective of both sort of the management and, and the employees um, and the sort of the developing employees perspective, I think finding a company that has values that are consistent with yours in this area is incredibly important. Um, when I founded our firm, there were two parts to founding it. One was the story I told earlier about how there were founders who didn't get the right legal support. The second part is people leave my profession in droves, in particular women, um, because there aren't challenging, interesting roles available that don't require 80 hour work, 80 hour work weeks. Um, and so that's the other reason that I formed my firm was to honor the choices that attorneys and staff make about their work life and their commitments to their family and their community. Um, And so that permeates 
everything we do here. It permeates the relationship between the professionals and the support staff, um, it, the support staff and the professionals, how we all collaborate and support each other when we need time off for whatever it might be. And so, and we lead with that. We lead with that, not just when we're recruiting employees, we lead with it with customers because we've found that customers respect our approach in this area. They read our mission and they see it posted on the wall when they walk in the office, which I have to say is not that frequently these days as in the current situation. And it resonates and they appreciate it. So I think acknowledging um, that when you join a company um, that have, being in sync with their values is super important. Um, we are within our final few minutes. Uh, so uh, one quick story on this question, but I'll, I'll, I'm gonna just give you the heads up. I'm about to do the lightning round. So you get a few extra seconds to think, just kind of wrap up final thoughts, advice for the group before we turn it back to the UConn staff, kind of think about your 30 to 60 second um, uh, formal closeout anyway uh, for for this, but uh, I don't, I won't identify him or his company because I didn't uh, think that this would come up in quite this way, but uh, during last year's Elevate uh, series, there was an executive that we did a session with and a variation of this question came up and he gave two answers that I thought were really terrific. Um, uh, one regarding more his himself and uh, his, his own self-care, uh, he, C-suite level, exec and his family time and his vacations were super important because he works a lot of hard hours. Um, and of course, when you're at that level, there are things that can be important enough that justify breaking in uh, to a vacation. But the way he has managed that over the years would be to tell uh, not only his assistant, but his team, uh, I'm going to give all of you my uh, spouse's cell phone number. And his, his wife was an executive in her own right, senior executive in her own right. If something is important enough that you think you need to reach me, by all means, I want you to, but you're going to have to go through her. And I'm doing that because I realize that's going to make you think, like, does this need to involve me? Or is this just, you know, reflexive kind of, we're, we're used to going to the boss, so we go to the boss, right? And he said, and you know what? Uh, thank God nothing has come up of crisis that justified reaching out to me. But he said also, no one's ever... No one's ever contacted me. So it's been really great for me to get that time to think and to show my family I love them in a different way, which was an interesting story. But the same individual told me, uh, uh, told the group rather, another uh, sort of anecdote right after that, where somebody, I forget one of his more senior people, kind of like maybe junior exec kind of level or whatever, um, was just, you know, I don't know, I would call it workaholism, but whatever, was sort of the, always on, always available, um, sort of hard charging stuff. And he had, I think, tried to coach this person on so many uh, uh, moments, not just for her own well-being and her performance over time, but what she was modeling for the people in the organization. And finally, after a few years of it, he said, you know, you might be one of our best, but if this doesn't start to get better for everybody's benefit, uh, I'm going to ding your bonus next year. Because how you lead and the message that we send, if you're, if you're acting one way, but we're saying that we expect something else, people aren't going to believe you. And they're going to be killing themselves and they don't need to to be successful here. And I thought that was a pretty bold move to be willing to do that, right? So um, with all that, lightning round, like 30-ish seconds, um, I guess in the order we introduced everybody. So Bernie, you want to go first? Just final thoughts before we turn it over to the UConn staff? Final thoughts, you're all UConn graduates. Um, education does not stop with your diploma. You need to be a lifelong learner. I graduated 36 years ago. I'm learning something new every day. Commit to learning something new. Great, and Louise, I think uh, you were next, yep. Okay, um, I would say two things for those couple of people on the phone who are thinking about going to law school. Um, per the, the poll earlier, I would highly encourage you to take some time off between undergrad and law school to just work, Partic particularly if you could work in an industry you think you might be interested in working in after you graduate. Um, for the other you know, 80 plus percent of you who have no interest in law school, I think that's great. Um, it definitely is not for everybody. Um, but I would say that when you find yourself in a business role where you're interacting with attorneys, 
and the attorney makes you feel like you're stupid or you don't understand something when you or that you really should understand something that you don't, you need a new attorney. Great, BJ. So um, if you're early in your career, make sure you, you find a company that fits the company whose culture fits you as a person. If you, if you are a, uh, uh, depending on your personality, a startup may, may be good for you, like a chaotic dynamic environment versus, uh, you know, or, or a, a large uh, systematic stable company. So it's different for different people. Figure out what your style is and try to get, uh, get to a company whose culture fits you, right? And second, um, Early in your career, make sure you take as many intellectual risks as possible because failure is not that expensive when you're when you're young and early in your career and doesn't hurt as much. So put your neck on the line, develop a reputation as a can-do person. And finally, when, when you're early in your career, you can get away with focusing on your strengths and forgetting about your weaknesses. But as you climb up the ladder, your weaknesses become a lot more important. There'll be a spotlight being shined on them. So make sure you address those weaknesses head on. Early in your career where they're not that important, still work on them, like be it uh, communication skills or interpersonal skills or what have you. So that's it. And uh, Wonderful. Dan. Well, I learned one thing today that I can give my wife's phone number to my employees and go to the beach. Uh, I guess that's, <laughs> uh, talking about learning, I think this is learning is a new benefit. Um, uh, depending on, on what, what your specialty, between 70 and 80% of the skills and the knowledge you need, the competencies you need to do your job, are not learned in school, even at UConn. And therefore, choose a company that will provide you that learning. If you go to a company, it is just great to be that, uh, you feel that you're gonna work well in that company, but you're not gonna learn a lot, stay away from it. Go to a company that will give you learning the same way they will give you medical coverage or dental coverage. Learning is more important. That's it. Wonderful advice. Thank you for all of your contributions professionally to your fields of knowledge and most especially today, Kate, it's all yours. Perfect. Thanks so much, John. Thank you so much to all of our panelists and to all of you who tuned in today with your thoughtful questions. If we weren't able to get your question, we'd be happy to follow up afterwards. Please don't hesitate to reach out directly with me um, or Josh or Alyssa as well. And also feel free to go ahead and reach out to our LinkedIn friends here. Make sure you put that note so that they understand what you're talking about as the advice has come through. Um, just a quick reminder, we do have one more event in the Elevate series coming up next week. It is our resume tune-up, the COVID edition happening next week on March 2nd. Um, it's tips for the best uh, resume, no matter what your situation. So we hope to see you there. In the meantime, thank you again to all of our panelists for sharing your story and all of your wonderful insights. We really appreciate it and stay well. Thanks so much. Thank you.